you know, got pretty lucky and binked a small tournament for like two grand or something um, at some point in that winter break, which bumped my bankroll up. I think I'd worked it up to 50 bucks to a thousand. Now I'm getting closer to five gram. Over the course of that semester, by the end of the semester, I think I had worked it up to 500K. Hey, me and my buddy, buddy, we make it all of this money. Yeah, I know it's rude to be bragging. Right. They never catching us lagging. Right. Me and my buddy. Hi right, guys, uh, welcome back. Table One Podcast. Justin Young, Art Parman, very special guest, Cole South, joining us. Uh, where, where are you from? Or where are you living right now? Thanks for having me, guys. I'm out in San Diego. Wow. But DC originally, right? Yes. Yeah. Grew up in Virginia, lived in DC, and then moved out here maybe eight years ago. Yeah, I, I looked at your Wikipedia. Uh, William, Williamsburg, right? Like I, I, I've went there many times as a as a kid for the rides, not to visit you. But <laughs> oh yeah, see so Williamsburg. People churning butter, you know, all the colonial people out there. Yeah, went to school at William & Mary. Okay, cool. Yeah, I actually went to school, well, I w- an offshoot school at William & Mary, Christopher Newport. But uh, sure, I yeah. grew up in Gloucester, so a stone's throw from Williamsburg. Nice. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, I had some friends that went to see you and I think I went there once or twice to visit them. Nice. So uh, tell us about uh, Virginia Cole South. Like, uh, like growing up like into games, poker, any of that stuff, or do you have like higher aspirations as we all should? No, for sure. I was big into Magic the Gathering, the uh, kind of old school card game that got a lot of people into, you know, gaming and poker and stuff. Um, I was huge into skateboarding. That was like my life in high school. It's just really big and um, yeah, making skate videos with friends. Do you have any photos you can send us of uh, grunge, Cole South? Uh, There's a couple like YouTube videos out there. Yeah, some old school. All right. Skate parts. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then I went to college at William Mary and pretty quickly in college discovered poker and that kind of, um, yeah, fueled my competitive desire for something new and got really into it. Uh, yeah. I'm sophomore year of college. So what'd you go to uh, college for? What was your initial idea of a uh, adulthood? Great question. I didn't have much of a plan, but, um, I liked math. So that's what I was studying. Um, I kind of like enjoyed just the problem solving aspect of it as far as like the practicality of what to do with it seems like most people who study math just end up in teaching math, but um, I didn't really have a, a serious plan there. Did you, uh, did you finish school? I did, not at William Mary. I went to William Mary for roughly two years, then dropped out to play poker. I had um, had one semester where poker was really taken off. I had built up enough of a bankroll that I was like, hey, look, I gotta give this a shot. So I moved out to LA and Vegas with some poker guys from the two plus two forums. We got a big house. All lived there together, just grinded poker. Uh, it was a pretty fun poker house. Uh, and then ended up moving back to the East Coast two years later. Lived in D.C. with my then-girlfriend, now wife. And after two years in D.C., um, transferred into Georgetown and finished up there. Okay, nice. Well, let's, let's backtrack just a little bit. Like, what, what was your living situation when you were at Living in Mary when you first kind of got into poker? And what what is had a bankroll mean? Uh, yeah, so I was living in a house with a bunch of other guys. This was like prime time of Chris Moneymaker on ESPN at the World Series of Poker. Everybody was into it. Party Poker was advertising on everything. And I think I put 50 bucks on Party Poker and, you know, tried to run it up. I didn't really know anything about poker. I never like grew up playing poker or playing home games in high school. But I could tell that the other people playing on Party Poker just were making blatant mistakes. And so it seemed like, okay... <laughs> maybe, yeah, you, maybe you guys <laughs> maybe I, I, uh, it seemed like the sort of thing was like alright I bet there you know if you knew what you're doing you could make some money in this and bankroll management was always my weakness I you know would put 50 bucks on run it up to a thousand hop in 30 60 limit hold them with 10 bets or whatever <laughs> run it down to zero so I think I did that like three or four times was in the hole 200 bucks or something a man after my own heart yeah for sure <laughs> Yeah, it's it's for some reason it's very refreshing the the people that put on fifty dollars multiple times as opposed to we've had a few of our guests who are like yeah no we just put in fifty dollars and I just ran it to millions I'm like come on like little adversity little like no nothing just no just success right away and just never look back but I don't know why it makes me happy but I'm I'm glad you had to fire a, a few fifty dollar bullets at it for sure yeah and like I think on the last bullet I was like all right this is my last one like I'm not going to run this up. <laughs> And then sit in 3060. Like, so I like came up with a spreadsheet or something. I'm like, all right, this is how I'm going to move up in the stakes. And I went and like checked out the two plus two books from the library. I was like, all right, I'm going to take this seriously. And if I run, run this one down, I'm not doing it again. Wait, there was two plus two books in the library? Or is it like a virtual library? 
No, this was literally the physical library at, in Williamsburg, Virginia. Wait, wait, you can just go to your college like thing and this, there's two plus two books on how to play poker? I, I don't even think it was a college library. I think it was like the public library. That's nuts. I didn't know that. What year is this? Like 2005? Yeah, six, 2005. So you, were, so you were you were young then. You were 18, 19, and then you started running it up. When did you, when did you start getting, were you successful right away after you started sticking to your bankroll management? Because I remember... For those that don't know, that might be a little younger watching this show, uh, Cole South or CTS was on the, the t highest stakes battling all, all taker, all comers uh, back in the day. It was fun. Uh, it was fun watching digitally stalking you. But, uh, <laughs> but what, what, uh, tell us a little bit about the, uh, the trajectory. Yeah, for sure. So I think I was in Williamsburg for winter break where um, it was only a couple of us at the house. So it was like a little bit more quiet. And that was when I was like, all right, I'm going to take this seriously and see what I can run this up to following some bankroll management and I, you know, got pretty lucky and binked a small tournament for like two grand or something. Um, at some point in that winter break, which bought my bankroll up, I think I'd worked it up to 50 bucks to a thousand. Now I'm getting closer to five grand over the course of that semester. By the end of the semester, I think I had worked it up to 500 K. Well, Jesus. Holy shit. <laughs> and that's why I was like, at that point, all right, like, I feel like I'm onto something here. I'm not really going to classes anyways. I'd rather take one thing seriously than like split my focus and kind of do them both. Was, was this during the time where they were slowly releasing the uh, like the new higher limits for for two card anyway? Where before I think fifty cent dollar might have been the biggest game, and then whatever, all of a sudden like two five and five ten, and like within like a couple months, it went from like fifty cent dollar to like twenty five fifty was available on like party poker. Is that any of that, any of that ring a bell? Yep, exactly. Yeah, okay. All right. So. During that spring was when I switched from limit hold'em to no limit hold'em. So I think like around April, I started playing no limit. I want to say I started off at two four, and I think at that point they had five ten, but no higher. And then they pretty quickly added ten twenty, yeah. and then ten twenty on party poker. At the time, that was the big game. There was no twenty five fifty there or anything, and that was like, all right, I'm, my aspiration is to move up to this game, compete with guys like Blood Sweat Tears. Um, he was like kind of my the guy I really looked up to in those games. I don't remember. I don't remember that. Well, I, I, I wasn't I, quite on. I was playing with you back then. Not that I was anything special or anything like that, but yeah, I was. I was. I was there uh, attempting to make a lit. Not not five hundred k bankroll, but you know, I did all right. <laughs> but yeah, Robert 07. But like, I, okay. I, I, I honestly, I think the the main times I actually played with you is when I got completely hammered. This is a little bit later, maybe like two thousand six, and I would come home and I would just play two hundred, four hundred, like shorthanded PLO cap games and stuff like that. But that was. Yeah, that was a little bit later, I suppose. Yeah, it must have been. Yes, I certainly had my fair share of that occasionally, too. <laughs> Definitely need a breathalyzer on my computer back then. <laughs> so, so you uh, <laughs> you, you didn't, uh, so you moved out to Vegas uh, after you you left school after two years. So you ran up your bankroll, and then you, you jumped over to Vegas with, uh, what, who did you move out here with? It was with a couple two plus two guys, Slider, Billy Jex, Dan Bright, and Tongany were their names on two plus two. Um, right, we had a big house together guys. in Hermosa beach. Uh, it was, it was very fun and like good formative experience. Cause we we're all trying to work our way up the ranks. Um, and everybody's trying to help each other. Yeah. It seems like a lot of, a lot of the best guys came out of that kind of environment. Whereas like other guys just, you know, focused grinds, head to the grindstone, trying to do it on your own. It's, it's not as easy as, as when someone can point out like an obvious mistake you're making that you would never see on your own. <laughs> Totally. And poker can be isolating too. Like I feel like not just on the technical side of things, but on the motivation side of things, when you're in a rut in the downswing, it feels like every time you load up a session, you're just going to lose. Um, there's something to like almost turning it on like a team sport where you're rooting for other people. They're rooting for you. They sort of have your back where, you know, there's not letting your, uh, you know, emotions get too low, that sort of thing. That's great. So like how often are you coming to Vegas while you were living in uh, Hermosa beach? Was it often? Did you play live yeah, a whole I mean, lot? Or was it just every other month? And then I would spend the whole summer out there for World Series. Um, and I played a, a ton of live cash games um, in Vegas, kind of those 2007 to 2011 years, those summers. So where were you playing mainly or what, what stakes? Bobby's Room, basically exclusively okay. at Bellagio. Um, mostly mixed games towards the end, like a 2K, 4K um, limit. And then usually 501k no limit in PLO with a 50k cap or something like that. And, and this fit into your, uh, your poker bankroll plan that you had planned out. Like 
there was no like you weren't pushing any edges or anything like that like playing that big because the swings for those have to be huge for sure yeah so in a game like that i was typically keeping half my action and selling half my action to three other guys that um you know if i would leave the game and, or go home for a week or something one of them would play and i have a piece of their action so it was oh, a good okay. way to do it where you know i had some exposure to the games when i wasn't playing and i wasn't taking 100 of my action in a huge game but i mean still 50 percent of your action in a game like that is freaking big all right guys quick break from the table one podcast we just want to let you know that if uh you know you can't afford to play our game sadly that there are other options to get a piece of these glorious people. What are the options, Justin? <laughs> well, we're going to give some kind of a promotional giveaway here coming up soon for 5% of our uh, main event. And that's, you know, first place is going to be like 8 or $10 million. So you can do the math for 5% of like that kind of money. We, we don't do that kind of stuff. No public math. Firm <laughs> policy here on the Table One Pod. But he's right. We're going to give away 5%. We just don't know how yet. So if you want to find out how we are going to give away 5%, all you have to do is click the link in the description below, the top link. It's going to go directly to our newsletter. Put your email in, uh, click submit, and then you'll be subscribed to our newsletter. And in a few days, weeks, time, depending on when you're listening to this, uh, you will get the information on how exactly you can qualify to win a piece of us. But just to let everyone know, 5% of zero is unfortunately zero. That is the only math we're going to actually give you. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> so you may be signing up for nothing. But we're, we could win. We might. We might go first and second. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh wait. All right, back to the show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, if I... If I recall correctly, you uh, I saw something I was reading down your Twitter timeline, trying to get a feel for, for the Cole South brain. And uh, it seems like you uh, are big on like marathon sessions. You would, I think I saw a post where you're like, I lock myself in a room and uh, play for 16 hours. Is, did you do that live too? Just grind until the game oh. was no good anymore? Or? Absolutely. Yeah, there's one session where I remember we started the game at 11 a.m., same group of people are playing till like 11 p.m. Everybody quits except for me and the one guy who's stuck a ton in the game. We play all night. My wife is bringing me like a fresh set of clothes. <laughs> <laughs> really funny. The, the other guy, um, he was moving around from seat to seat at the table too. Every time he gets stacked, he'd just, you know, be super tilted. Oh, this seat's unlucky. I'm going to move to another seat. So then the next morning, it's like 11 a.m. again. People are starting to trickle back into the poker room. One of my buddies s sits down and is like, what, there's like chest hair all over my spot of the table. Like, what is this? This is so gross. And then he looks around and like every seat has like a little mountain of chest hair from this guy. <laughs> this guy was shedding. <laughs> oh, you get stressed out, you lose hair. <laughs> yeah. Check raised him out uh, of his beard. <laughs> yeah. And then we played all day that day. And I think probably quit at like 8 a.m. the next day. Holy shit. Oh my God. Yeah. That's a, it sounds like it was a good session though. If he was moving around that much. Yeah. <laughs> for sure and like i tried not to play like degenerately long sessions if i was stuck um but if things were going well yeah for sure i want to press it and i'm like just kind of like a obsessive intense person in general and have a hard time oh, let's play poker for an hour here see how it goes and then go move yeah. on do something else now i gotta be zoned in that's impressive because like for for me like and i think for a lot of people out there when you start to get up a little bit of money you want to you know you want to put put that into the old bankroll and uh and not continue to play even though that's probably when you should continue to play because you're playing your best and then you know they call it stuck for a reason so <laughs> <laughs> eat like a bird shit like an elephant yeah that's right yeah yeah that's about right and that was like a big focus of um what i tried to do in my poker career to not just be a good poker player be but be a good professional poker player there was in particular um, one piece of software called tilt breaker that would track your winnings through a session and then you could set a trailing stop loss. So, you know, it's good to let wins run, but you also don't want to let them run back all the way to the ground when you start tilting or just you're playing, you go from playing your A game to your B minus game. And so I really like that piece of software. Where like, you know, I would really try to let the wins run, but once they started coming down, all right, let's, let's quit. I think there's like a really nice mental aspect to that, that you're just building your confidence to when you have more percentage of winning sessions. You don't have these sessions where you win a ton, you come back, you lose a ton, you're stuck small. It's like, okay. I'm really focusing on booking wins, getting that momentum, getting that confidence. I think poker players, at least when I was coming up, massively underrated the mental side of the game. And people thought, oh, you know, I've, I've got my A game. This is how I play. And it's like, 
No, nah, it's, it's hard to quantify that stuff. And the difference, you know, especially at a high stakes game between playing your A game and your B minus game is huge. Yeah, yeah. You can justify a lot more uh, peels when you're, when you're buried that, uh, <laughs> that you don't think about in the moment at all. So I, I, that's a cool, I never heard of that software, but uh, could, have been, could have been helpful to me, I think, coming <laughs> up. <laughs> so did you uh, have a, a strong preference between online and live? Uh, like, obviously, you're a bit of an online legend. Um, I'm sure you are a live legend as well, but like you played such nosebleeds. I'm sure a lot of people hadn't really heard of you in the live live sectors. Yeah, for sure. I liked them both. I mean, online was my bread and butter. I really liked playing heads up matches online where I could get four games going with the same guy. We'd have this, you know, marathon session where it's like me trying to get in his head, him trying to get in mine um, for high stakes. That was like the competitive aspect of that. I think it's hard to touch. And it's definitely like, you know, a crack like dopamine rush too of, so much action going on. That's a little different from live poker, but live poker is pretty cool too. I, I liked playing those summers in Vegas where you just, you meet super interesting people. It's a totally different skill set. where I think a lot of the online guys for my era went to Vegas those first couple summers. And he's like, these guys are total donks. They've been in Vegas for 20 years, winning all the money. Now we're going to come in and take it all. And like, didn't really go that way. You know, there's a different skill set between, you know, winning in a high stakes live game than as opposed to winning in a bunch of multi-table online games. Yeah. Do any of those uh, those grind, heads up uh, four table grinds like? Do, is there a specific marathon back and forth battle that you can remember that like really sticks out in your mind that it's like makes for a good story? <laughs> yeah, for sure. I mean, probably some of the biggest ones were against this uh, Finnish player, Alari Sahamis. His name was Zygmunt, and he and I just you know battled for ten years straight. It felt like um, yeah, we had some good ones for sure. And he was also just a real character and. You know, he would stack him and he would just go off in the chat on you. And, um, so he was always exciting playing him. Awesome. Yeah, I remember when he first came onto the live scene, you'd see him. He's he's a definitely definitely a character. He's animated and uh, <laughs> interesting play style too. Very aggressive. If I totally, yeah. He was like a good bridge between, I feel like, the poker personalities in 2004 when like ESPN was kind of building all these personalities, Chris Moneymaker, Sammy Farha, and like the online guys who were like, really good at the fundamentals of poker, but like maybe didn't have the um, kind of aura around them. That the, the Riz, was. that's what they call it these days. <laughs> they use that right? He has two young daughters. I don't know. I'll I'm trying my, my best. I'm not yeah, really sure. I think that means something special. So like you, you never back down from like any heads up match. Cause like, I mean, I was reading, I, I, I remember some of the battles just as an observer, like I would get on there, but like, whatever you, you played everybody heads up that like wanted to play you basically like, is, is that pretty accurate or like? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I backed down from heads up matches all the time. But at some point I played everybody. For me, it was all about like, all right, I got to be, you know, I'm not just going to roll out of bed and play Phil Ivy at heads up PLO. Like if I'm going to take on an absolute top tier opponent, I want to be feeling my best. I want to be doing it coming off some winning sessions. So I feel like I have that momentum on my side mentally. Um, so there are plenty of times where somebody had sit against me that I thought was super good. And it's just like, hey, I just don't feel like playing the world's toughest game today. Um, and I would sit out, but I feel like at some point in my poker career, I gave everybody a shot because the way I looked at it, even if I played somebody who was better than me, I was going to learn something from it. And those learnings from the very few players at like at my peak that I thought were better than me, were going to be so useful for playing the next 10 guys below me. Sure. And th this question is mainly for me, just cause like I, I was a bit of a fanboy of the higher stakes back then. Like give me your, your top three toughest opponents you played like online, like. I'll, I'll know the screen names and the names, but I'm just All quite right. curious. I got to give put, put Phil Ivy up there just because he was so like mysterious. He played a different way from everybody else. Um, he just he never quite knew what he was going to do. As opposed to, I feel like some of the other guys, they had really tough game plans to figure out, but it just felt like a little bit formulaic where they just they wouldn't do something that would like totally surprise you too often. Gotcha. It was more regimented. I got you. Yeah. Ike Haxton, I think, was someone who was like in that more regimented style, but like super solid. Um, I feel like I never, never felt confident against him, you know. Which maybe that was just the way the cards turn out. But I was every time I got in a pot with him, I was like, oh shit, it's, you know, <laughs> this is not for not going to go well for me. And then I think Phil got on someone who he just always seemed to play as a game. I never see him make a mistake. I was like, oh man, Phil is really, uh, you know, time went on today. He just always crushed it. Yeah. Oh, that's a hell of a list right there. Yeah, that's I could see learning a lot from those guys for sure. And I know exactly what you're talking about. Not in the heads up sense, because I don't play heads up, but like playing against someone where everything that you 
don't want them to do in a hand, they do it. And then every time you want them to do a certain thing, they never oblige. So that's, that's kind of how I feel like you're in the, in the anaconda's grip of the, uh, <laughs> at the poker table whenever you're in a hand against someone that's playing, playing that well. Totally. And then it just feels like it's a self-fulfilling prophecy where you're going in with low confidence into those hands and, you know. Yeah. No, that's good. That's a good list of uh, bad guys that are really good. <laughs> so I, I, I imagine it's got to be extremely tough to go from like nosebleed cash game stakes to even consider tournaments as an option. Did you ever like kind of dip your toe in the water here and there just to, you know, just to get the hype from like the TV coverage or whatever it is? Yeah, for sure. I, I had a couple deep runs in the main event. I think I had two runs where I finished in the top couple hundred spots. And I mean, World Series Poker main event, that's a really cool feeling. You get to day five and that sort of thing. The energy in the room is pretty thick. Um, that was cool. I think, uh, you know, now that I'm like a little bit more of a casual poker player, tournaments are more appealing to me where I can go out, okay. out to Vegas for a week, play a couple tournaments, um, you know, maybe have a deep run. I definitely had that aspiration of like, oh man, that would be pretty cool to win a bracelet. But it was hard to go get the motivation to play the 1500 Raz when game <laughs> was firing in Bobby's room, you know? So I did, I did notice those, those couple runs or whatever you had, uh, but I know you played like mixed games as well. So did you ever hop in like the 50K like PPC or like some of the, I wouldn't even call them high rollers because like back in 2010, 11 or whatever, it was all like the main events were whatever, the 10K 08 or the 10K horse or whatever, like that's as big as it got. Did you ever like dabble in those as well? Yep, I played a handful. I played the 50K PPC once. I played 100K one drop once, um, okay. but you know, could count them on one hand. So, so how, how does the, not the anxiety, but I guess the excitement level like kind of equal out, like I, I, you're playing 500,000 PLO versus like, you know, getting in a, a, a 10K like horse event, like, is there, is there like any of the equality as far as like your, not preparedness, but like, you know, just like your excitement for like before the first hands dealt? Oh, totally. The tournament is more stressful for me, for sure. Even though it's way lower stakes, just in a cash game, that's where I'm comfortable. I feel like um, for me, anxiety and performance is like all about like um, having that proven track record of success in your mind. And you're like, hey, I've been here and I've won before. I can do it again. I've never won a World Series bracelet. I've cashed in a couple of random tournaments. Like, so when I sit down, you know, even in a 2,500 no limit or something, um, I don't have that reliable track record that I think that I personally need to be confident in something like that. So when did you start transitioning out of poker, I guess? What, what, like, I want to know what drove you as well, but like, what, what was the year? What was the time frame uh, that you started kind of like uh, sliding out? For sure. So 2016 is like where I pretty much quit poker cold turkey and started an e-commerce business with a good poker buddy of mine. And for that first year, we were playing a little poker on the side, but it picked up enough momentum that we're like, all right, it's going to be a little weird if like one of us is just still playing poker. Let's just both focus on this entirely and go all in on it. So it was just that easy for you? There, there was no no like weeding period where like you were like, oh, here and there. You're just like immediately it's like cold turkey, like no more poker. I want to do something else. For that first year, I was definitely still playing a little poker here and there, but it was, I guess from 2011 to 2016, those are like the post Black Friday years and it became harder to play poker in the US. So when my wife and I were living in Washington, DC, I had an office up in Montreal. Then we moved to Portland, Oregon. I had an office in Vancouver. We moved to San Diego. I had an office down in Rosarito. Yeah. It was becoming just a pain to play high stakes online poker. And I was always pretty conservative on like, the VPNing side of things. And like, sure. so I was traveling back and forth quite a bit. In hindsight, that was probably a little bit too conservative. It seems like nobody ever really got shut down for that sort of thing. But <laughs> um, yeah, the, the lifestyle of going back and forth was uh, grinding on me. The ceiling of what I thought I could make, even if I had a great year, was coming down both to, to the online poker game shrinking and the quality of players going up a bunch, especially those last couple of years when solvers became more and more heavy. It's like, all right, man, if I'm going to have to, if I'm going to want to take this seriously and like stay at the top of this game, I'm going to have to study in like a totally different way. And if I'm going to have to do that, maybe I'll just try something new. All right. So was that an easy thing for you to find? Like, was there just like a kind of a niche market you wanted to get into or were you kind of like randomly searching like across the board of like something to, something to do? 
it was more of the randomly searching. So it's a good buddy of mine, my business partner, David, uh, he and I had known each other for the, uh, through poker since 2005. And he was a big part of why we moved to San Diego. He and his wife were good friends with me and my wife. And so David and I would walk our dogs at the dog park each morning, just kind of kicking around ideas. He was in a similar phase where he was looking for something new. And yeah, started 2016, we we're like, all right, let's just do something. It doesn't matter what it is, but like get something up on the side so we can get like some experience doing something outside of poker. And at the time he had two young kids and his wife was not crazy about the options of baby shoes when they were shopping for baby shoes. She was like, they're either like $60 pair of baby shoes that like my kid's going to throw one out the window or the dog's going to eat one, like, <laughs> or they're going to outgrow them in the best case in three months or like a $5 pair that's drop shipped straight from China in a dusty plastic bag. We're like, this is sketchy to even put on my kid's feet. So the first idea was like, hey, let's do something like in the middle, like a mid-market baby shoe, $25, $30 pair of shoes that is like backed by an American company with safety testing standards. Um, yeah, so that was our first product. And it did just kind of, I didn't take off like, like a rocket ship, but it took off slowly. And it was the sort of thing where like people loved the product. It was starting to sell. And I'm like, I don't know. I feel like we're on something here. Let's, let's keep it going. And yeah, we built that brand up. And then we, um, what was, the, what was that brand or what were the early, early steps of that? Because I feel like a lot of people, a lot of people watching this are kind of older school like us. They like poker, but they might be in business or they might even be thinking of transitioning to, to business. Uh, like how do you, how do you as one go about saying, okay, I'm going to make a $25 shoe. Like yeah, whatever you, <laughs> you, you made a, an idea for a widget. Like how did you get the widget produced? Like how did you get it advertised? Stuff like totally. that. So went to Alibaba. Looked up manufacturers of baby shoes, um, got samples from like five or six of them, kind of picked the ones where we both liked the quality of the product and we felt like we had a decent communication relationship with the manufacturer. Placed a small order for our first order. I want to say it was like a few hundred pairs. Um, so, I mean, we're talking like a couple thousand dollars, two thousand dollars, something like that. Um, wow. did, did David make his uh, kids put on the baby shoes and walk around and... Oh yeah. Like if they didn't cry, <laughs> you guys were like, Oh, all right. That one's good. <laughs> Pretty much. And like his wife, liked the style and like, you know, we just like the quality of material and we initially started selling them on Amazon. Um, just if that seemed simpler at the time where it's like, all right, we don't have to figure out how to like make a website and stuff. We'll just figure out how to sell something on Amazon. And so that was our first sales channel. Um, and how we got the initial customers. Wow. Cool. And then you just started, what, slipping a little, thing in their shoe like actually we have a website it's uh <laughs> www.babyshoe.com <laughs> yeah, baby was that taken i don't know a amazon's kind of strict about you trying to pull customers off their platform and to some extent more sales on amazon create that snowball effect of like now your product has more reviews and now it's ranking higher so i don't even think it's a really a great idea to try to pull customers off if, if you could to some extent people who want to shop on amazon want to shop on amazon that's great people want to shop on our website it's great too what was the name of the brand? Bird Rock Baby. And we still own and run that brand. Bird Rock is a neighborhood in San Diego. So, yeah. What kind of volume are you guys uh, pushing these days? Uh, I mean, you know, millions of dollars of baby shoes each year. Nice. That's a lot of baby shoes. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you have any kids yourself? I do, too. Yeah, four-year-old and two-year-old. Okay. So they're, they're, rocking the, they're rocking the brand? or rocking uh, the Bird Rocks. Kind of just started aging out of it. Like our sweet spot is newborn to 18 months on the baby shoes. And Bird Rock Baby, while it was our first product and our first brand, and we still run it, it's now a smaller part of the business. Uh, we started a jiu-jitsu brand as well, where Dave and I train jiu-jitsu every day. It's a market we know really well. And so we launched a bunch of jiu-jitsu products. And the jiu-jitsu brand, Gold BJJ, has grown to be bigger than the baby brand by significant margin. Yeah, I was looking you up on a similar web and you guys were getting like 75,000, I think, uh, users a month, something like that, to come to your website. So that's that's pretty big. That's a, that's a lot of people coming to, to shop gear and supplements. So Yeah, and again, Amazon's kind of a bigger part of the business than our own websites too, so yeah. Wow, sick. Just a quick break here, guys. Are you tired of playing with players like this? Not this, no, like no. this? Or this? <laughs> Or do you want to play with players like this? Oh, wait, you have a oh, <laughs> If you like having fun at the poker table, table one is the game for you. 
we play high stakes, no limit, 100, 100 blinds. And if you wanna get into the game, it's actually super easy. We have a website, table1.vegas. You just go to the website, you click get a seat in the game and fill out the form. It's that easy. It's your name, it's your phone number, it's the date that you're here, and I will personally reach out to you. And it's only 5K minimum buy-in. You know, run it up at 2.5 and join us. Are you guys working on any other brands or are you just focused on the jujitsu brand and uh, living living a good life? <laughs> yeah, pretty singularly focused on the jujitsu brand. When we started the business, we we're like, oh, we're going to figure out how to launch a brand and then do this a bunch of times. And we ended up launching five brands. We've since sold three of them and we still run Bird Rock Baby and Gold BJJ, which um, is a great lifestyle business for Dave and I with young kids. We... You know, we work hard, but we're not killing ourselves on the hours. I could spend a ton of time with the family. We're working on products that we personally use and love. Uh, that's been fun. Nice. What were the, uh, is it all the same kind of like clothing brands or what other e-com brands? You said you sold three? No, one of them was a fitness brand. Um, the, the, the biggest one we sold was a fitness brand. Had just a variety of fitness products, foam rollers, yoga mats, that sort of stuff. One was a barbecue accessories brand based around like a random barbecue product that I designed. I'm big into grilling and I had kind of like a unique idea on how to build something. And then the third one. Well, well I want to hear about this one, just specifically this one. Like what, what was the, uh, the idea? For sure. I can't share what the actual product oh, was nice. um, after selling the brand. Um, but yeah, it was I got you. a product where I went to a cooking class once in Europe um, and they had this product like all around the kitchen and I just couldn't find it in the U S and so kind of, invented something similar and brought it to the US market. Smart. Yeah, that's great. So, <laughs> well, all right, so what was the third one? Uh, third one was a random swimming accessories brand. Basically, our manufacturer for some of the jiu-jitsu gear, they made swimming gear. And so we started a swimming brand despite not knowing anything about swimming, just because operationally it was very easy. And we could see that, hey, there is search volume on Amazon for these swimming products. The competition doesn't look that sophisticated. We'll put it up there. So how do you do those kind of searches? How do you know that the, the market's a bit void in, in certain areas? Like I, as a complete newbie to like anything business. Totally. So there are, you know, software tools that will like give you estimates of search volume that say, hey, maybe 2000 people a month are searching for swimming knee brace, something like that. And then you mm -hmm. search for swimming knee brace on Amazon and say, hey, what does the competition look like? And there's only two people selling swimming knee braces. The first one only use one possible image when you can put up to 10 images on Amazon. So they're like way under optimized. And then on Amazon, it also, every item has a best seller rank, which tells you roughly how many units a day that item's selling. It's like, hey, this guy's got a pretty weak listing for a swimming knee brace and he's selling 200 of them a day. This is a pretty good market to get into. Oh, just that easy. I mean, <laughs> I don't want to say easy because that still sounds very daunting to me, but like, all right, it's compared to, compared to studying for poker and, yeah, yeah. uh, taking your lumps for, uh, you know, <laughs> losing for six months in a row. And then <laughs> seems, uh, seems like a interesting, interesting way to, to go about it. And I like that you just kind of took your, what, you know, after learning from the first brand and just like, just kind of systematically, it sounds like applying it to the same formula. So, yeah, that was the initial plan, but yeah, I feel like Dave and I kind of realized that like, we enjoy figuring something out once we can tolerate doing it a second time but we don't want to do it five times. It gets boring after <laughs> once or twice. So like, we just wanted to build one or two brands tops and kind of ride those out. Were those, uh, were those brands you sold good exits? Yeah. At one point, the market for buying and selling e-commerce brands like during COVID was insane. There were these um, kind of Amazon aggregators, people call them. Thrasio was one of the big ones. We sold our fitness brand to them where they had raised a billion dollars to go buy Amazon-based e-commerce brands. And they just pushed the prices up for people selling brands to crazy levels. Um, so it was perfect time for us to take some chips off the table. Yeah, that sounds like a really smart time to sell when all the money's coming in. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I, uh, while we're on this path, I noticed you had a recent recent Twitter thread from, or whatever they're calling them these days, a long, long article where you kind of went into like, if you're a poker player that wants to get out of poker, this is how I did it. This is how I think I, this is how I think it could work for you, basically. And you, uh, you do you want to kind of, uh, people can go back and read it. It's a couple weeks ago, actually. It's not that old. But uh, if, if, if you want to give people kind of the, the short version of that or, or the long version, whatever, we got time. <laughs> for sure. Yeah. I mean, it's a question I get a lot um, just, you know, because I played poker for a long time and then have transitioned out of it. Um, and in my eyes, like poker players, if you take this 
singular focus that you put so intensely on poker to get good at poker, which is not easy. If you're winning money at poker, like you're a smart person, you've figured something out that's not easy to do. If you take that focus and put it on something else, you can probably have success there too. I think the hard part is actually moving that focus. So I feel like a lot of poker players who they want to do something else, they do something on the side, they keep playing poker and they just, you know, have a hard time actually moving out of it. And that never really gives the new thing that focus that it needs to, you know, start planting some seeds and growing. So if you're, you know, a poker player looking to step into something new, I think uh, really having a plan where like either you're quitting poker cold turkey to work on that thing for a set period of time, or you're sandboxing your poker time. Like, hey, I used to play poker for 40 hours a week. Now I'm going to play poker for 10 hours a week. I'm going to play, try to play the best 10 I can. And maybe I'll make 20 hours worth of uh, what I was previously making in those 10 because I'm cherry picking the best 10 hours, but I'm not thinking out, uh, po about poker outside of those. And then it just really comes down to like, what do you want to do outside of poker? And I feel like the thing that poker players kind of need to wrap their mind around is like, you can either get into another game like poker that isn't poker, whether that's day trading, flipping NFT, something like that, where, you know, you're to some extent trading money around and trying to win this competitive game. Nothing wrong with that. Poker players transition to that really well because they've already done it in one niche. Um, but I would strongly consider, urge you to consider uh, starting a business that is more like a traditional business where you're building a product or service that people are, you know, happy to pay money and get value for. Because in that respect, you're starting to separate your time input from your money output. When you're playing poker, even if you're playing super high stakes poker and you're crushing, you're not making money when you're away from the table. And to some extent, it's the same in any of those similar games, whether it's day trading or, you know, crypto or something like that. Whereas if you're, you know, building a business, you're building this asset that's kind of working for you. You can sell it at the end of it, move on to something else. Um, yeah, so that's, that's really the category that I would like to urge poker players to move into. There's been um, some guys that have had huge success there, like, um, Brian Tate was one guy who I played a bunch of high stakes poker with. He started Overnight Oats. It's like massive um, CPG company that has absolutely crushed it. Great products, super impressive entrepreneur. Um, yeah, and I just know that like, hey, if you've succeeded in poker, you can take this and do it in something else. Like it's it's not easy to be a winning poker player, especially today. That's good. Yeah, I, that's a very good uh, summation of it. I believe at the end though, there was one one more bit where you said, and if you're a poker player that wants to start something, yeah, let me know because I, I really like investing in poker players, helping where I can or just rooting for them. I think poker players are a pool of talent that um, is underrated and really sharp people that if they, you know, really do take that focus and put on something else, have a strong chance of success for sure. And I, 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 I do agree. Like, I feel like it's very often, I, I, I don't know how to quantify it, but like at least a few times a year, someone, else, someone will say something at a poker table about an idea and we're like, oh, that's such a good idea. That's a million, like we just call it, it's a million dollar idea. That's great. And we all just sit around and we're like, oh, that's really good. But no one does anything about it at all. And like, I, obviously there's probably some hiccups that like would come along the way. But like the, the motivation for, I would say, a lot of poker players is quite minimal. Just uh, as far as like trying to do something new. Because uh, it's just scary. If you're like, you know, we're, we're confident in playing poker. This is, we're good at this. We know that. But like. Me specifically, like I, I wouldn't even know where to start. Even if you gave me a million dollar idea, I, I wouldn't even know like where to go, like any of this stuff. And it's, I think it's easier to take the the road uh, more traveled sometimes. Even though being a poker player, like we consider ourselves more renegades or rebels. I think that's true, and but but for us, like I like being a beginner again, and like starting this podcast and starting. I don't know, you probably aren't familiar with us, but we have our own like game at at the aria that we run, a reserve game. So make poker fun again is our mantra. And, uh, and I don't know, I've really enjoyed like trying to learn the, I mean, obviously it's not a, you know, not a big brand or anything like that, but it's been really fun trying to sure. turn it into one, you know? And, uh, and yeah, so we really appreciate you coming on and having, uh, having this kind of open discussion about business and poker and the crossover. It's good. For sure. Yeah. And everything has to start there. Like you have to have that humility to be like, Hey, I was playing poker for a $40,000 buying game you know, two months ago. And now I'm placing an order for $2,000 of baby shoes. That's going to take three months to get here. And like, you can't be so zoned in that you're not seeing the big picture of what you're trying to work towards. So yeah, having that like white belt humility of like, Hey, I'm gonna start something new. 
I'm going to suck at it. I'm going to be playing in the penny stakes game and I'm not going to be embarrassed about that. Like I'm not going to be trying to pretend I'm more than I am there or like jump up into high stakes and lose all my money right off the bat. That's a critical skill set. So did, did you ever have uh, any businesses that I don't want to say failed, but like whatever, didn't meet your expectations? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so I've started a couple software businesses um, in the e-commerce space that man, building software, it looks easy. It's super hard managing developers and stuff. So I, yeah, I think, last year wound those two businesses down for, you know, just absolutely torched some money there, like literally made nothing back. Um, <laughs> those would be the, the freshest ones in my mind, just because those are both equal and frustrating. But, but it happens enough to where it, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't get you down too much. It's kind of part of the variance of uh, starting a business is just is what it is. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, to some extent, like you control your downside on this sort of things. If they go well, the un upside's uncapped and the downside is like, all right, a few months of frustration and I lost this money putting into this, but hey, learned a couple things. So next time I start a software business, I'll be a little bit more prepared. So do you have anything in the works now? I know you can't tell us directly because we might steal your idea. <laughs> We're not going to do anything with it. Don't worry. <laughs> no, really. I mean, I've got young kids. Um, I'm focused on our e-commerce business. I'm not trying to work any more than I'm already working. I have a great lifestyle with my current business. Um, really trying to focus on the bigger picture rather than launching new businesses right now. Are you still working with David directly as far as like a partnership on almost everything? Oh yeah. Yeah. See each other every day. We train just in the morning and then go to the office and work together and settle any office disputes with a, a good jujitsu match. <laughs> I, I was going to ask, cause like, I mean, even if you're working with your best friend, your brother, whatever, like, I mean, there's going to be disagreements. There's going to be heated arguments at some point. Like how, how do you guys handle those? I, I can't imagine you guys don't just wrestle right away. <laughs> I, honestly, maybe it is pretty good that like, you know, we get that time on the jiu-jitsu mats where we're beating each other up, like, let off a little bit of that steam. But I think Dave and I are both like pretty even keeled people. And, and in my eyes, the biggest thing is just like respect for the other person. If he feels super strongly about something and he wants to do something one way, I just respect the guy's thought process. And so like, I don't think he's, you know, making a, dumb or selfish decision decision. If he feels super strongly about it, great, let's do it your way. I might not have done it that way, but I'm going to commit. I'm not going to try to self-sabotage things in the background. Like, let's just do that your way to feel strongly about it. I feel like he kind of takes a similar approach to me and it's worked out great. Yeah. We really haven't had any big arguments starting the business. Well, wow, that's amazing. It's nice to have a partner like that. Ah, well, <laughs> no, sorry. Uh, either way. <laughs> so who, who's better at jujitsu? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a brown belt. Be honest, come on now. And Dave's a purple belt, so yeah, I got him outranked there for sure. Uh, you're a brown and what is he? Sorry. He's a purple belt, so he's one rank below. Yeah. Purple? Yep. Oh, wow. Is, Noob. It, is it any kind of a competitive contention when it comes to that stuff? Or like, when it comes to jujitsu, you're just on your own personal journey and like, you're not trying to be better than the next guy. You're just trying to improve yourself. Absolutely. And it's similar to like the poker house sort of thing too, where like, you know, we train at a jiu-jitsu team. We sometimes go to competitions and compete not against each other, but like, it's a one-on-one -on -one match, but I'm in his corner yelling at him, hey, you know, the arm bar's open there, you got two minutes left, you need to score, that sort of thing. So we're rooting for each other on the Jitsu mats, for sure. Well, yeah, you can't compete against each other because he's below you. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's, if that he was sense. a little yeah. better, maybe. No, yeah, yeah exactly. Compete. I mean, if he improved a little bit, then maybe you'd be, you know, be fun to compete against him. But yeah, I get it. He's worse. I get I've it. got 35 pounds on him too, which he points out every time we roll, so. <laughs> so like, if him and one of his kids try to fight you, would it be an even match or? No. <laughs> <laughs> so you just punch the kid right in the face. Yeah. Him down. yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know how jujitsu works. It's like punching kids in the face a thing or like you just like subdue them. I don't no, know. No, it's all, it's like uh, grappling. So it's all wrestling. You're basically, there's no striking involved, but you're trying to take the other person down on the ground. And then when you have them on the ground, control them and submit them with some sort of choke or joint lock. They just, they just tap out or they just stop breathing and then you figure it out later. Yep. Okay. <laughs> We've had some good ones where, you know, somebody gets choked unconscious and then wakes up and say, oh, I'm late for a wedding. Oh, it's going to kill me. Uh, dude, it's 6.45 in the morning. You're at the jiu-jitsu gym. <laughs> so how often do you, you train every day or like you at least spar every day? Yeah, every day. You have aspirations to be a black belt? I mean, is that like a, a goal of yours in the future? Yeah, for sure. You know, like everybody who starts jiu-jitsu, like the belts are a key part of the sport. But like at the end of the day, like, you know, I know blue belts who are freaking absolute monsters on the mats and some black belts who like are a little bit less skilled. And so like the belt is like a rough marker of your own personal journey, but yeah, you know, I, I don't like leaving things unfinished for us. So for sure. Like getting a black belt in jiu-jitsu is a goal of mine. 
Does uh, David's kids, uh, they play because his kids are a bit older than yours, or is that right? Okay. Yeah, his are six and 10. Do, do they uh, participate? Yep, and so does my son too. My son's four, and yeah, he'll be going to Jiu-Jitsu today. Yeah, he loves it, and they get to wrestle with their friends and get some energy out. That's great for kids. Yeah, must be hard to convince the kids not to uh, finish the arm bar off, you know? <laughs> <laughs> They're so flexible, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's so hard for them to get hurt as opposed to me. Like, you know, I feel like I tweak my knee walking down the curb on the way to Jiu-Jitsu, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, as someone that literally just pulled his groin playing kickball a couple days ago, I can attest. We had a field day for a, 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 a for a wedding of a, a buddy of mine. They they wanted to have a field day the day before the wedding, and this is a bunch of thirty five to forty five year olds just like pretending we're athletes again or whatever. But yeah, we, there was a lot of uh, pulled muscles and uh, uh, realizing you're not as uh, athletic as you used to be. Like, I bet. Back in my day, I used to be able to do like and yeah, that's all out the window. Yeah, there's there's a lot of pulled muscles, but yeah, I, I didn't even get to finish the the, the field day because I. I pulled a hammy trying to beat out a uh, in, in infield single in kickball. That's that'll do it. You're still a white belt at kickball. Yeah, I, I'm terrible at kickball. I just want to get on base. All right. Well, before we wrap up, let's go back in time again to your poker heyday because I feel like a lot of this business success and poker success uh, is a, a main theme as a bias for action to just to just make a decision and just do it and then see how it runs out. And I remember. Uh, seeing something about you uh, on Black Friday, like moving that day or something like that, uh, if I recall correctly. Can you go back to Black Friday and kind of run us through what you were thinking and how you thought about that whole situation? Yeah. So Black Friday was, what, April 15th, 2011, where I loaded up full tilt and I'm still logged in. I can sit in the lobby and like see the tables, but there's not much action going on. And then I load up fulltilt.com like in my web browser and it's this super janky FBI notice saying like this yep. domain has been seized. And it was like pixelated. It, it looked fake. Like everybody was like, this is the full tilt get, like hacked or they getting like ransomed or something. Um, just because it didn't look real and the actual poker room was still up if you were logged in. But pretty quickly you realized that, hey, no, this is real. The executives all had indictments against them. Um, I had a bunch of money tied up on full tilt at the time because of course, if you're playing Let's say you're playing 100, 200 PLO. It's a $20,000 buy-in game. Like kind of bare minimum, you need to keep 10 buy-ins, 200 grand on the site. And realistically, if you're four tabling, like it's going to be more like 500 grand. And so, you know, I had a big financial incentive to like figure out what was going on and get my money back off there or figure out how to get back in the online poker scene. So over the next few days, I really just started talking to people in different countries because this was clearly a US-based ban. And people um, yeah, in Europe or in Canada could still log on and, and play, withdraw their balance and stuff. So it's like, all right, I quickly need to figure out how to be considered a European or Canadian player so I can access this money again. So flew up to Montreal, scheduled some meetings with realtors um, on the flight on the way up, um, rented an apartment for a couple of years and just got up there, got my lease, got my gas bill, got my bank accounts open with a bank statement exactly what full tilt needed, you know, to consider me a Canadian player um, and unlock that money. Yeah, that's, that was, I mean, super sharp. A lot of people lost a lot of money or had to wait a very long time to get yeah. their money. And, uh, and you, you definitely played that, that situation, right? So kudos, kudos to you for that. Yeah. It's a lot of money. Maybe, like we, um, maybe like a month ago, we had Lee Jones on, who was the, uh, basically the tournament director for like poker stars. And he, he brought up, you know, their, their role in, kind of buying the assets of full tilt at the time just to make them the, the players whole, the American players whole again. Totally. Yeah. Poker stars and Isaiah Scheinberg, like really just saved everybody's asses on the whole thing. Um, Damn right. Like I, I know they got like, I know they got a good stuff out of it as well in the back end, but yeah, that, that, uh, it definitely made me happy. Like I, I, I remember that I think I had like 50 K in there and that, that was like the world to me at the time. So yeah, it was a hell of a time <laughs> <laughs> to be in poker, but, uh, all right. Well, what about uh, what about future Cole? I know you're going to continue to work on your uh, your business and possibly invest in some hungry 37 year old poker players trying to get out. But uh, and beat up on Dave. But are you gonna are you gonna come play any poker anytime soon? Out to out to Vegas out here? Yeah, I flew out to Vegas last summer and I played a World Series event. And just kind of met up with uh, some old poker buddies out there and it was super fun. So I think that's probably going to be at least one annual summer trip to Vegas to 
play some cash games or play an event or something. Do you have one like watermark for this summer? No, I don't have it uh, planned out, but definitely make it out at some point. Yeah. All right. You ever get down uh, to a local card room where you're at and play? I know you got a few in San Diego. No, there is one that's pretty popular. It's called Seven Mile. Um, and I've got some buddies who play there. But um, yeah, since getting out of poker, I feel like going to play a, sh a short live session or something, especially with young kids and a family, it's just not something that um, is in the cards right now. Fair enough. In the cards. See how I did that? I see it. Okay. It was just, it was just, impressive. I, mean, like, I don't know. I felt like it just went right over your head. Like I don't. I don't Most think... things do. So. <laughs> Got any uh, degenerate gambling stories from before you were a good boy? Yeah. Oh man. You know, I was always so like intensely focused on poker and like succeeding and winning at poker that like I don't have any too crazy stories. I mean, people. There were some antics in Bobby's room for sure. People getting upset and throwing the card plaques all across the room and. But that you never did thing. that? Uh, no, I was always... You ever rip cards? No, 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 no. Yeah, I was always, if I lose, try to take my losses well. Um, I just, I felt like I was like a, you know, if I'm winning in a poker game, like overall, I can't be an asshole when I lose then, you know? Like, it's... It does make sense. It does make sense. <laughs> form, you know? so, um, I feel like I was always very con conscious of that, like, especially like in online poker, like, dude, if I was poker stars... I would have kicked me out of there so, so long ago. Like all I did was take money off the site, you know? Um, so I was always pretty conscious of that like, Hey, bad player sits out. Let's at least play a few more orbits yeah. or something. Let's not like hit, sit out next big blind. The second they go take a pee break, like, you know, let's try to make this um, an enjoyable experience for everybody. So no broken mice in the house, in the Cole South household. No, that was, that was never me. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's impressive. <laughs> I mean, it's different. I understand live, like you can control it. I know you me wrong. I would get frustrated when I would lose, but I feel like for me, it was like, um, I was more frustrated with myself, you know, that like, Hey man, this guy really outplayed me. And like, I just got beat up this session it, rather than like, I don't know, taking it out on the mouse or like compl blaming luck or something. It was more like just kind of internal. So frustration. Did you go downstairs and like have a, a beer to untilt or like a pint of ice cream? Like you just had no vices whatsoever? Please tell me you had something. Oh, beer would be the vice for sure. Yeah. <laughs> okay, beer. Thank, all right. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, so my wife and I have been together for, we've been married 10 years this year. Um, so, you know, for most of my poker career too. And I always felt like I couldn't have a bad poker session and then go hang out with her and be a total grumpy dick about it too. Like have to have some sort of separation and, you know, separate these two parts of my life where, you know, it wasn't horribly affecting the rest of my life if I had a bad session on the tables. Easier said than done. Do you have any of those same feelings when it comes to business? If you have a bad business day, do you need like a, a couple minutes to like kind of like regroup before you go home to the family or your kids or anything? Man, business is so slower paced than poker. Like poker, you get that instantaneous feedback. If I'm four tabling somebody in a heads up match, like it's probably either going to go well or it's going to go poorly. And I'm going to know the second I step away from the computer lag on business decisions. If we order some new product, I mean, it could be six months before it's here to sell. Um, and so like business, the kind of the frustrating parts would be like on a day-to-day -day basis, let's say uh, you get sued for something or there's a product liability thing or your Amazon account gets closed down. I mean, I feel like I, those don't really rattle me that hard. It's just like, all right, we've we got to figure it out. You know? Yeah. Do you got, how many uh, employees do you guys have? We're very lean. We've got me and Dave, three people, in our San Diego warehouse, small team remotely doing customer service and stuff. Are you looking for two more? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, honestly, we, we, we like where we are. We're, uh, Dave and I don't love managing people. We're again, like we like our small team, but we're not like looking to grow this side to a huge team. And yeah, that's the cool thing about like running an online business too. Like you can get pretty impressive scale with a really limited headcount. Yeah, do you have like local, uh, cause you obviously go to a gym for jujitsu. Do you, are you providing the the geese there for the customers or you have like local local guys? Yeah, yeah, we have a decent wholesale program. So our uh, jujitsu geese are in a bunch of gyms and my wife runs the wholesale program for Bird Rock Baby. And so she's got our baby shoes and 500 plus boutiques around the US. Nice, what's the, uh, what's your best performing, uh, the supplements probably? No, um, definitely the jujitsu gear. Yeah, just the uniforms. So in jiu-jitsu, there's two types of jiu-jitsu. There's gi jiu-jitsu, where you're wearing like the traditional kind of karate style uniform. And then there's no gi jiu-jitsu, where you're wearing just rash guards and fight shorts. And traditionally, gi jiu-jitsu was way bigger. But in the past few years, no gi has kind of exploded in popularity. So we've really tried to like make that a core part of our business, the, the rash guards and fight shorts sort of thing. 
Cool. All right. Well, I'm all out of questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we really appreciate it, Cole. Um, it's a, an honor to have you on there. Like I said, like back in the day, I was a bit of a fanboy, and like I, I know I got to battle against you a few times, but I don't know. It was kind of nice uh, kind of catching up and uh, rehashing. Awesome. My pleasure, guys. Yeah, where can uh, people follow uh, follow Cole South if yeah. they want to uh, if they want to stalk you on on Twitter or Instagram? Yeah, you can find me on Twitter. Cole South is uh, my handle there. That's pretty much it. Are you blue check verified? Uh, I think so. Yeah. Nice. Oh yeah. Give that money you, to Elon. You got that kind of blue blue check money. I like it. Yeah, but not not getting any money for uh, for my my reach or anything yet. So yeah, hit me with a follow. <laughs> Yet. Yeah. Maybe after this podcast, it'll <laughs> yeah. blow up. There we, go. we have literally <laughs> hundreds of people that are going to watch us. Literally hundreds. <laughs> and some of them will know you already. <laughs> All right, man. Well, uh, thanks again for doing this. Maybe we'll see you this summer. Yeah. Um, you can come bash our heads in at table one. <laughs> That'd be fun. <laughs> That's good. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Me and my buddy. We make it all of this money. Yeah. I know it's rude to be bragging. Right. They never catching a slack. Right. Me and my buddy. We working hard for this money.